Okay, uh, today is September 11th, 2011, 10 years after the um, September 11th attack, but today I spent time working on a genealogical line that's far enough back that um, I think I'd probably just talk about it and, and um, use it as an example of some things that could be instructive for other people or, or helpful, I guess. So this was, uh, I guess I'll start out with what it is. Okay, so this is basically, I'm working on the family of Thomas Shepard and Mary Jones, Mary Jones, which will be important. I'll point out why it's Mary Jones and not Mary James, as far as I can tell. Um, but the, the, the evidence is in favor of it being Jones, and there are other researchers that um, are related to um, Mary Jones by her brother um, that also moved into, um, this happens to be McCracken County, Kentucky, um, to, um, and they've, they've done some work, and they, they're pretty sure that their ancestor's sister Mary, Mary Thomas Shepard, not not James. I mean, I'll, I'll get into the, all the details about that. We'll first start out with the information that I had to start with. Okay, so I worked my way back, and I got to an ancestor named Obadiah Johnson. And that ancestor, there's a death certificate for the individual. And in fact, I can just probably go over here. Yeah. Okay, so this is it as a prints out from Ancestry. Um, you know, died 1912, age 82, implies a age of 1820, if I could do my math right. <laughs> I believe I got my math right. Um, and for the name of the father and his birthplace, and the name of mother's got down as some people have interpreted as being shepherd, I would say reasonably it could be, and birthplace of mother don't know. And so, of course, in genealogy, we want to work our way back, and we want to be able to prove the parentage of an individual to go on. But anyway, he was married to someone named Nancy Ellen Shepherd. I kind of like the way I ended up putting this presentation together, and I'll go over that, but that's not the main thing. Here's a, here's a transcription of a marriage record that comes out of McCracken County. I haven't seen the original. St. Obadiah Johnson married Nancy Ellen Shepard, 9th August, 1861. That marriage date works analytically for, for, for their set of people. Now, on Nancy... Sh now he's trying to work back and go and look into Nancy Shepard's parents and siblings. And what I try to do is I try to get as much information about all direct ancestors of the subject person that I'm working on, or such individuals I'm working on, and their siblings, because they can provide, those different pieces of information can provide other clues that'll help resolve things that wouldn't be resolved otherwise. If you just focus on just the ancestor and their spouses, which should end up being your direct ancestors, you can include, I guess, if you excluded second um, spouses, it may leave out some a lot of context. Uh, there's another uh, line I'm going to go over also that I was pretty happy when I saw an obituary. Uh, I think it's kind of amazing that it's, that it's a different subject. Maybe we'll do a different video on that. Anyway, so we've got here on this, it says clearly that, you know, Nancy Johnson's dad was... Nancy who died, Nancy Johnson, who married Obadiah Johnson, born Nancy Shepard, because her father's name was Tom Shepard. So that's how they derive that. Mother's name, they say, is Polly James in this transcription. If you look at the face of this, and it, even though I don't have the clearest camera focus here, it doesn't get much better than that. So I thought, oh, James looks reasonable, but Jones might have been, and someone else had asserted Jones. 
And then if you go into um, Ancestry.com and you look at some of the family trees that are contributed, there's a pretty good presentation there. And um, for for Johnson family. But um, I'm not going to get into everything that the whole, the whole deal about it, but basically they, they list it as, as Polly James. And they give a birth date, and they say that this Polly James was born in Gulford County, North Carolina. Well, I wasn't really satisfied. I, I'd like to have something behind that, some evidence to know how that, how that conclusion was derived. I mean, you can see from here where it's got Miss Nancy Johnson having a father named Tom Shepard that you can derive her, that's how they derive that her last name was Shepard for her birth name, right? But I just, it just isn't clear or strongly written enough to know whether that's Polly Jones or James, at least from the collection that I got this from my ancestor. So, what I wanted to do is I want to see if I could figure out who the brothers and sisters of this person was, of uh, this Nancy Ellen, and from that, see if I could find a death certificate for any of them. Well, I went to look, and I went through, the first thing that you want to do in, in genealogy, basically what you want to do is you want to have an overall story, and then you want to have vital records that fit within that story. It, and the story fits within the vital records. It's a push and pull. You go in circles a little bit, but you try to get the basic story. Now, whoever had done the um, Johnson family tree had gone, had found some really difficult finds. So, for example, here here's a index to Thomas Step Sheplin. <laughs> So the hand, and the handwriting looks like it says Sheplin, but it was, it was, it was Tom Shepard, and there's, there's his wife, Mary, and Laura, who is buried at what is called the Johnson Graveyard, at least at Find a Grave. And I'll tell you why I have that Mina in questions there. Um, is also there. So, you know, I found this, but it's not really critically material, I guess that ties in directly with, with the gravestone. Everything is, is both has to analytically make sense and tie in overall as a whole for anything to work. Now this here is really a transcription of the 1860 census. I'm not sure if you're going to even be able to see uh, the, the original records from this camera that well enough to make sense of it. But So we got a Thomas, we got a Polly J, so that with the Thomas and the Polly J uh, goes hand in hand with the death record for Nancy. Then we get Nancy, so we have a match, right? This was the key census that told me I had a match. Then we have a, uh, but there were other outside uh, pieces of information that that also reinforce that match to make it you know, that I have sufficient competent evidence, reasonable assurance, at least in my mind. Um, then there's an Elizabeth, and there's something called a Jeroma. A Rhoda and a Mira. Now I'll make a few comments about some of the things that would happen in this part of the country that I learned in a set of um, families that were easier actually to to trace down because all the gravestones are nicely placed in one spot. Um, St. John's Church, Catholic Church, Duca, and they a lot of them, most of them, are not find a grave photograph taken and the exact date of birth and death uh, on appearing on the gravestone. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, there's some people that would um, go by their middle name an awful lot during their life, or they just use another name. Even though they had a first name, and sometimes they would put this other name in official records, that's how I know about it. Ends up... I've drawn the conclusion that this Jeroma here was also Sarah Ann. And this Mira was also Laura. The Laura that appears up here, but it's, but it's not a perfect match. That's six years off. This Laura. <laughs> she only aged six years and two censuses. I could be wrong in that conclusion. But what happened to Mira? Well... 
don't know. She could have died. So there could there could be an additional daughter that I don't have on this. But so far, I've treated her as the same. But as you can see, if Mary Polly James was born in 1810, as it's saying over here, 1850, that's 40 years old. That's about the... Uh, most genealogists start scratching their head if, it, although it does happen, you know, children are, sometimes are born when, after a mother is 40, but anyway, and also it's very easy to get a 6 confused for a 10, and in fact there's a neighbor who died, Jay can't even see it, but anyway, so I don't want to get too much details for there. Then I got the 1850 census. I, I have Thomas and there and Rhoda is not yet named at the age of two and there's Sarah, Elizabeth, Nancy, Margaret, Mary, and Thomas. And I even looked at the 1840, what the heck, why not? And there's Thomas in the right date range and everything works. There's Nancy, there's Margaret. That's just icing on the cake. And then there's a Kentucky land grant where I might get some clues as to where he came from besides just North Carolina appearing in his census, uh, if I get my hands on a document with a little bit more of information than just a Thomas Shepard. But where Thomas Shepard of what, you know, what the situation was, correspondence, things will let me know where he's from. Now, another very interesting thing about this, the gravestones, so I don't know if you can see it that well, but there's no date on that. So this is a gravestone for a sister shepherd. And appearing in this cemetery are a number of unmarked graves, in fact, that I actually hope to identify. There's some without dates that I hope to actually come up with down the road. So let's just take a glance at this. And there's, there were some questions I ended up answering. There are, in the Johnson graveyard here, there are members of the Alexander family, a Bean, a DeWeese, a Garvey, Harper, a bunch of Johnsons. It's from a, a lot of them are from a later generation. A few Loftons, a McNeil, Sanderson, and then there's a number here that are just, they don't know. They're blank. You look at the picture, they're actually blank pictures. And a number of Wallaces. And... I had gone about a procedure that, that I'll talk about first before I even looked at the rest of those. I just thought, well, I didn't know anything about the nature of the cemetery, so I assumed that, well, even though this is called Johnson Cemetery, it's not as private as I ended up finding out that it was. I had assumed, but now after doing some work, I, I figured out it's a lot more of a private uh, cemetery, but over a number of generations in this family. But what doesn't help much, um, or what is something to overcome, is uh, is the fact that, that on a lot of these there aren't dates here. I've also mar I got this set up. I got a printout. You know, each child has a number. Seven children here. There might be eight. Again, I admit that. Um, and then when I found something related to the the individual, I'd mark it. So this is, I and this I've assumed. I've assumed his oldest daughter. Uh, Mary L., which appears in the 1840 and 1850 census. See how I reference this up? And before I had a list of nine, and I noticed, well, why is it that Rhoda, or why is it that uh, Laura is in the 1860 census, but not in the 1870 census, and why is it that Mina, at the age of 16, suddenly shows up in the 1870 census? And I, real, I thought, well, Laura's got to be Mina. And so everything kind of works. So Mary and Margaret Lavina were in the household for, until they were about 20, and then they left and they got married. Nancy was born right on the border, so, you know, when she was 22, she got married, so she got caught in three of those. There's Elizabeth with two of them, and then she got married. And there's Sarah Ann, who I figured out also there was a Jeroma that was had the same birth year as a Sarah, so... I assumed they were the same person. 
could have been twins, but I doubt it. I've seen no other information about a Rhoda. Although the empty graves could be for them. And then there's a Rhoda, and then there's a Laura. Okay, so I've started out. And then I thought, well, how am I going to get... These are all... Every child they had was a daughter, so if they got married... I'm, how am I going to know... How am I going to know their last name when they died if they got married? And also in Kentucky, the death certificates of these three children, I ended up only finding two death certificates. And that was for Nancy, and the other was for Jeroma. And that's because, as far as I know, they lived as long as 1920. Okay. One di one birthday, only one birthday of exact date I was able to get from the markings in the gravestone. Because the cemetery mostly, most everything else there is marked very plainly, except for Margaret or Lavita or Olive Olivina. <laughs> Whatever situation you find her in. Um who has, is listed as the mother and the wife of Thomas Wallace on her photograph, but I hadn't had that knowledge. That would have helped me somewhat in being a little more familiar with what I needed to weed out later. So I ended up looking at all the death certificates that were released in Kentucky because of the limited scope that I had, and I hadn't guessed that Sarah or Jeroma would have married Blaine Harper to know to look for a Blaine Harper um, I got all the death certificates that had any variation of Shepard spelling that died in McCracken County that they had from the collection that contained death certificates and that generally were records that are running they only run about a span of 20 years or maybe a little bit later the, the later ones are are actually transcriptions that you can't see all the information like the father's name or the mother's full name or where they where they came from. It changes over the years. Uh, to give you more concrete, well, I don't really think I have to exactly know what the date range of the Kentucky death certificates are when they when they show the full detail or a copy of the certificate. But I get the idea; it's probably not too much later than the 40s, if at all. So I searched for every, um, everyone that died and had a mother named Shepard, from whatever variation of spelling there were. And there was S-H-E-P-P-E-R-D, S-H-E-P-P-A-R-D, S-H-E-P-O-R-D, S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D, S-H-E-P-H-A-R-D, um, you get the idea. <laughs> so there were like six to eight lists, and then I did a sound X and looked through them all. And then I looked at the names, and if the names of the mothers of these individuals that passed away matched up with the names that I had, to a reasonable degree, I said, okay, let's look and let's see if there's any way I could find out if Sarah married a Harper. Because I have a death certificate for a Sarah Harper with a... Or actually, no, I, I hadn't found that. I'd found... Let's see. Um, let's see, five. What did, I, what did I find? This is the one I eventually found that sealed the deal. But, um, this one here, so I found under five... First, I didn't realize there was a Sarah Shepard Harper at that gravesite. I found this Dr. Robert Dellen Harper with Mother Sarah Shepard, and I realized that matched up with five. And so, I, okay, well, let's see if I could find out when this guy was born, 1879. Well, that, 1879, I looked. That's where the analytics come in. Sometimes you have to use the analytics to pull things together. 
And so there's him being born in 1879. I realize, okay, well, Sarah was born in 44. She would have been married about 64. That's not too late. She would have been about 35 years old when he was born. Here's a Blaney. Let's look up Blaney. So I looked up Blaney. Looked up. Well, actually, I looked up Sarah Harper's death record. I just, I just went straight for the gun. I looked, and then there we go. Thomas Shepard, mother Polly Jones. And that was clear and sharp. Same state of birth of the parents, North Carolina. So I had it. It's Polly Jones, not Polly James. Unless whoever reported Sarah Harper's death had it wrong. It really was James, but only remember Jones. So I'd like to have more death certificates for these other individuals that died. But right now, I'm thinking it's a it's Polly Jones, Jones, especially based on the other compiled family tree that I found for some other family. There was a brother of Polly Jones that moved to Paducah too. So there you go. <laughs> So I have two pieces of evidence. I'm pretty sure it's going to end up being Jones. And they had found that uh, the marriage record between Jones and Thomas Shepard was it in Rowan, North Carolina, which may be on that other family tree. I'm not sure that it's already been put together. So after I worked all these thing, all these back, I had found that there was basically a child of a Wallace that had married a Shepard. A child of a Lovelace, a child of a Dunaway. I found no records for Rhoda Shepherd Bean, even though her gravestone said Rhoda Shepherd Bean. And I soon started to realize that everybody buried in this small cemetery were related to one another, and I asked myself, well, I found all these things, but I found no evidence of any Dunways or Lovelaces buried at this yard. So, Right now, to my mind, the idea that Elizabeth Shepard had married F. Brad Lovelace or William Andrew H. Dunway, there was an Eliza Shepard that married those two, but was it this Eliza Shepard? I can't say for sure. If I had just had those that ancillary piece of evidence, just a plain slab, <laughs> stone slab with the name on it, Lovelace or Dunaway, I would know that they belonged here. And in fact, on the Wallace gravestones, the only way I know that this shepherd is the same shepherd that appears on these uh, census records is the fact that they're all buried at the same place. Her gravestone does say that she's the wife of Thomas T.J. Wallace, and in various places, he's Jones Wallace. His gravestone says Jones Wallace, but in other places, he's Thomas J. Wallace. As you can see, that makes it a little more tough, but I got that. Um, the date on her gravestone made sense, and so I am fairly certain that the that I've got this right. Even though it's I don't have her death certificate to say to me, to tell me, that her mom was Mary Polly Jones and Thomas Shepard. The location of her gravestone is what I'm relying on in that situation. That's stronger than limited assurance, I would say. I'd say it's almost sufficient competent evidence, really. But almost sufficient confidence. Almost. Very close. I would be pretty comfortable with that. I'd be surprised if my findings were weren't verified in some manner. Okay. So, after I got those, it was just a matter of trying to get together as many records as I can, but I also wanted to try to explain all the different people that were here at the graveyard. And I noticed a number of Alexanders. I noticed they were unexplained. I noticed a McNeil was unexplained. 
two loftons, a Nichols, and I assume that the the three Wallaces. There's a Wallace Jones there, and then there's two other Wallaces. Just a little blurry to see, but it says Wallace Lavina Shepherd, Wallace Molly, Wallace Solomon, and Wallace Tommy, and on top Wallace Jones. <coughs> there's the five unknowns. Um. Now, well, yeah, they they have to be descendants of Wallace, Lavina Shepherd, and and. and and Thomas Jones Wallace, who's just listed as Jones there with no dates. Um, now, well, let's try to look into it. So I just worked backwards, or worked the other way around. So I, I threw, I put in James Lee Lofton here, and I assumed that this Robertia Lofton was his wife. I was right. And that assumption, as it turned out, and it also turned out that Robertia Lofton, and if I had the benefit of my program here, I probably it was it was someone related. At first, I had Robertia un unknown, and then I drew the conclusion that there was a, I think it was Robertia Wallace. Um, yeah, Robertia Wallace. That Mary James Lee Lofton and ended up. So I had a Roberta uh, Wallace in there, Roberta Wallace, and then I had a James Lee Lofton married to Roberta Unknown, and then I finally realized they were born in the same year and, the, and died in the same year from the death certificate from Roberta Lofton that I had found, and I put them together, and that was part of the chain of things that had happened. And so I found someone had put up a piece of information, a summary of some gene genealogical work that they did that I found that was um, fairly true. And so I'm going to try to find that. And that was under, probably under Margaret Lavinia Shepard, who's got the biggest thing, I've got the most and the deepest amount of support here. So anyway, here is her picture of her gravestone, but if you want to look at this page, you go to find a grave or surf, search for Levina Shepherd Wallace, 1838 to 1905, and you'll find it under, you know, if you could find a grave in there. I also just get a whole thing there. There's Jones Wallace, and where's the story that I was interluding to? Here it is. Okay, so there's a Allie Henry Bud McNell story. I just threw him in there. I didn't have a birth or death date. I just threw his name in there and did a search for Family Tree Maker, and this came up as the top. <coughs> so I did that, and then you notice that he's got a wife named Nola Josephine Wallace. And Nola Josephine Wallace also happens to be either a child or grandchild of Thomas Jones Wallace. So now we're starting to see that it isn't just the fact that um, that it's a Johnson cemetery really it looks like the story of this cemetery and I guess I'll summarize is that it was a cemetery that was intended for the shepherds all the, the shepherd family from you know the children of Thomas died out they had seven children all daughters <laughs> okay so um, from those seven dollar daughters um, one of the daughters married Obadiah and they had a very big Johnson family so a lot of Johnsons <coughs> ended up being buried there okay and um, so they're calling it Johnson Cemetery but really it was a, I, to my mind it was a shepherd cemetery and it seems to me <coughs> that the oldest daughter Mary died single I think she's listed there as Sister Shepherd is my guess and then the oldest daughter, Margaret Lavina, got the um, top priority rights to it. So that's why someone that had died as late as, if I can find it, oh yeah, here we go. I think it's 19... Well, someone that was born in 1961 is buried in the same cemetery 
as a woman that was born in 1838. Because <laughs> he's, he's a, I, as far as I can tell and conclude, he's a descendant of uh, Margaret Lavina Shepherd. Okay. Some of the Johnsons, a lot of the Johnsons were buried there, but... And who knows, Elizabeth Shepherd may not have had any wives or spouses at all, unless the again, unless the unmarked graves are for the Lovelaces and Dunways that are, that's in that thing. She may have died out too. I, I see, and Rhoda Shepherd may not have had any children, I don't know, or I don't know what the circumstances were. It may have started to get filled up. Filled up. Um... I'm just looking over these things. The, the youngest daughter, I think, died single. And so, just the, the gravestone markers and <coughs> the ability as a descendant of an individual who was the owner of the place uh, to bury, you know, your descendant there kind of gives you some idea, <laughs> you know, who their ancestors were, or helps and enhances uh, the overall piece of information, even though uh, there's only a couple of gravestones there that have birth and death dates. Some are just years. Some are just names. Some of the graves are marked. So that's basically my summary. What I did is, first of all, is I got a basic story, and then I tried to get the details of the story as much as I could from various diver uh, divergent records, either gravestones death certificates, providing birth records, because I only had a birth year from the um, census. Um, made my best guess based on the search back of actually the descendants, the the, um, uh, the, the death certificate. I looked for the death certificates of children of the individuals that were children of my subject, Thomas and Polly, Thomas Shepard and Polly Jones here, to find out who they may have married, because they were all all women have their last names changed. Identified the ones that appeared to have died single. Uh, the only real mystery is are, is Elizabeth Shepard, and she may have moved to another state during that time. I mean, 1842 until, you know, not was until the turn of the 1900s that people started sticking around to where they actually had settled <coughs> and decided they weren't going <coughs> to go find a farm to, farm to live in anymore. Pretty much the arrival of electricity, life changed for people. Instead of just wanting to find a piece of land to live off of, they um, went elsewhere. <coughs> and just to get into the Wallace, oh yeah, and to answer those other questions that I had, I looked into the Wallace family, and it, it, it just got tough because there's, there's a ton of Thomas Wallaces and, and, and Joseph Wallaces. Um, but I was able to find a few things. Let me just kind of look into here, and I think this would be kind of tough for some people trying to figure out what the hell happened. And this this kind of unwritten, <laughs> but just implied relationship because of the placement of gravestones on the ground is part of the pieces of the puzzle. So I did find a marriage record between Jones, Wallet, and in this case, the person, the individual, was listed as Margaret L. In one of the census records here for um, eighteen fifty, or sorry, Margaret M. And in fact, that's the only one I have a name for. Is now calling herself Alvina. And the only reason why I even got to the point where I thought, well, the, these wallets, she must be the same person. If you look at her gravestone, now she's calling herself Lavina. But she was Margaret. But she has the same year. Hers a birth year of 1838. <laughs> in fact, it may have been Mary that was Lavina, and not Margaret. Maybe Margaret was the sister. <coughs> now that I think of it, uh, this this gives her a birthday of about 1835. 
this Nan Nancy is actually listed as 1838 here, but I know Nancy went on to marry Obadiah because in all the all her chil all of Obadiah's children's death certificates list Nancy Shepherd as the mother. So I, you know, I didn't go into any more of that. So anyway, so here is she's definitely Mary Dill Wallace, and here is God. Is this G. T. Wallace on the stone? It's hard to see. Their birth and death date. And there's his without a birth and death date. So I had a bit of work to do. So here is actually one of the few I was able to find of the same family. <laughs> and the reason why I know it's the same family is I look here at Solomon Wallace and I look over here at the at the um, list of gravestones. Here's a Saul Wallace buried at the same place without a birth or death date next to a Tommy. There's a Tommy and a Saul. I know I got the right one. It says he's widowed, so that tells me that... And then again, I look back at this gravestone. Death of, 1805, of 1905. Widowed makes perfect sense. This is the same family, and they're in McCracken County. <coughs> so I found that. I found this story. And then I started looking into some of the children that were showing up. <laughs> it's a mess, I'm telling you. So here's a Willie Wallace, a Miss Willie, here's a Tommy J. And I think Morris Wallace actually was only mentioned in that little blurb. Yeah. He was only mentioned in this thing over here. Morris and Terry Ann White Wallace, and so I found that. There's the Terry Ann, so I knew I had that. There's the Nola, and the Nola is the person that, that married Bud McNeil. So now we got the McNeil covered. Where did McNeil come from? There he is. So who's who's got Lofton? <laughs> we'll find we'll find we'll find Lofton soon enough. There's the marriage between T.A. White and William Nathaniel Wallace. There's his death date. And there's Tara. There's this is a child of, of Tara and Morris. And I had also found out Garvey had a mother that was Margaret Shepherd, Margaret L. Shepherd. It's Lavina on the tombstone. <laughs> and Jones White and. There is her birth and death dates now that could be added to find a grave. This is her gravestone. So we have a death certificate for her, actually. That would, that would do to probably have that on there, at least on the outside, although it's a drive record. It isn't really original evidence. It's still... I may just do people well to know when these people were born and died. Um... Then here's Mrs. Molly Wallace, who was single, died single, daughter of Jones and Margaret Shepherd. That doesn't tell you about the, the Loftons, but here's Roberta Lofton. Roberta Lofton also was daughter of now Levina Shepherd and Jones Wallace. So now the identifier, the commonality was really the Wallace, and kind of like the Jones, but not really. Things seem to kind of move around, but anyway, they're all in the same place, so I know they're from the same family. And <coughs> so now, here's a Lofton. There's Roberta Lofton, who married a J.L. Lofton, and now we look over here. And we've got a James Lee Lofton and a Roberta Lofton. So that's, that's answered. <coughs> the only thing I haven't answered is Randall Nichols. Of all the people and and Talima De, Deweese, I'm assuming that Rhonda Shepard Bean married a Bean, but I have found nothing related to a Bean. And then I got you know, some birth and death records for for them. I noticed there was a Lavina Council, and there was actually another branch of the family that married into the councils, and they're married they're buried over at the St. John's Parish. But it's a whole different ball of wax. And here's a Harper that married a Lofton. 
and this ends up there are actually two identical records and I guess getting to the Alexanders what ended up happening is there was a James Alexander that married a Margaret Wallace and there was another uh, James W. Alexander and there was a James M. Alexander that married a Margaret Wallace and there are two different dates they're only about three years apart and I concluded that it couldn't be that I for a while there I was thinking that Margaret Lavina Shepherd had a second husband and that was James W. Wallace or James M. Wallace and they just didn't they couldn't get the date right for the for the marriage but it turns out she didn't marry the Alexanders at all and the Margaret Wallace Thomas Jones Wallace I come to conclude had a sister named Margaret that married an Alexander and that's why she's buried there and so now we have a question as to whether this was just a shepherd piece of land or it also was a Wallace piece of land or it became more of a Wallace piece of land because all the shepherds died out and the oldest shepherd <laughs> just like with the Johnsons who was the second oldest living shepherd uh, allowed a lot of Johnsons to be buried there that but this, but this is an earlier generation this Margaret I looked at the the birth the, the death dates and the relative dates of marriage and, and dates of, of children's births roughly and I thought well this has got to be an earlier generation so I concluded that Thomas Wallace had a sister named Margaret it's only limited assurance really of what that would be and then I got more just details of the individuals that were, were there I and mean, this goes on to the other family that I'm not going to get into now. So that was, it took a while, but I got it down. So <laughs> pretty happy with, with the result somewhat. I think more information can be had if there were more birth, marriage, and death records consistently available from Kentucky in one form. And they're not. <laughs> Uh, if you don't want them too late, and they kind of just—it's—it's it's kind of like a mess. There's like three or four different collections, some overlapping, some that just don't amount to much, like the the death index, you know, from Kentucky. It just says year they were born, exact date they died, and no most of the time no names of parents, just the mother's name on the later dates. And that's it. Now I want to do the Engelerts because this was kind of neat. So I'd really worked for the Englerts, and this is another family. They're all buried over at St. John's Catholic Church Cemetery in near, just 12 miles from Paducah, as it was just described in the mid 1800s. Um, basically, the subject I'm looking at right now was a Christine. Uh, the individual how I how I worked my way up to this is I was interested in the parents of Christine Engler who had married a Matthew Peter Pote. So I have this, and there, there were, for this family, there were six children. <coughs> and I basically write down, you know, where, what it is that I have that tells me when they arrived. And I got a couple pieces of very satisfactory, <coughs> one piece of very satisfactory evidence um, yesterday, and I also got <coughs> One surprising piece of information that gave me some context for this for this family and helped and allowed me to come up with an exact year they had arrived from uh, Bavaria, and I even think they may have I've even been able to pin down they came from Saxa Colburn Gotha, which is where the present royal family is from. But of course, there's there's more than just the royal family that lives in. Uh, the Saxa Colburg Gotha part of now Germany and at the time Prussia was it that or the Potes? I'm not sure. Anyway, I, I shouldn't get into that. <coughs> so what was very very helpful in researching this family was knowing 
what church they attended, knowing a little bit of the history about what had happened with, um, I had a very small portion of the history, but material. Um, there's a couple things, when the Germans first, uh, the Germans that I'm interested in, in studying, they, it says they arrived, in, in, yeah, I'm going to guess they actually arrived in 1848. They left probably during the revolutions that were taking place to reunite Germany after the fallout of Napoleon um, dismantling the whole Holy Roman Empire. And Germany was, I guess, <laughs> Uh, if you look in hindsight, uh, you can say it was trying to become one nation. And at the time, there were there were a number of various kingdoms that were in place over there, and um, there were a number of civil wars that were taking place. And in Bavaria, in particular, which uh, the the king of Bavaria, or whoever the ruler was, or prince, or whatever they called him at the time, was had an interest in Lola Montez at the time, which I find very ironic, although we do live in a small world. Uh, Lola Montez actually, uh, just as a side note, Savile Morton had a, uh, at least according to some of the reports I've read, which may or may not be true, but um, had a, fought in a duel over Lola Montez when he was in Europe, but it wasn't in Bavaria. So she traveled an awful lot. She ended up dying uh, in California, somewhere around here. Or probably her, her, the home that she died in is probably, it's, I think it's a historical site. It's probably within driving distance from where I am. But nonetheless, um, getting back to this. So anyway, the excuse in Bavaria for revolution was Lola Montez, but I guess the overall goal for the German people was more political freedom and unity as a nation, <clears throat> perhaps. Or maybe the aristocracy wanted unity as a nation, the people wanted more um, freedom, and they ended up fighting over each other instead of giving both what they wanted and leaving each other alone. <laughs> but ended up, I think they got some more liberty out of it, but you know, we know the history of Germany later on, it didn't turn out so well. But anyway, um, also there was some encouragement from the Swiss government to have people, don't know why they were encouraging this, uh, people to come over, go over to America. I don't know what the situation was. Um, there was some fallout again from Napoleon. They were just trying to, the Swiss were trying to reform their government. Uh, of course, Switzerland is a combination of French, Italian, and German speaking people in an isolated area. <clears throat> so I don't think that their goal was to unite with Germany at that point or Italy or France. They, they, they liked the way they were, but they were trying to get their constitution back to the confederation state that it was the Germans were fighting to get out of. Okay, so I've gone too much in history there, but anyway, so they arrived in 1847, which is an eyebrow-raising year. Um, and how do I know that? Well, I'll let you know <laughs> in just a second. Basically, I combed through all the records I could find, first starting out, same method I used with the other family, as I got as many censuses as I could find, and in this case, I'd only found the 1850 and 1860 census, really. Uh, Philip Engler died 1873, and I found the mother, the wife, which has yet to really been identified correctly, uh, but I will now. I actually found another piece of information in addition to what's posted on some of the shared trees at Ancestry. <coughs> um, she lived past 1880 and was living actually in the house of Matthew Pote and Christ Christine Engler, who I'd worked my way up from. I'd seen her there. And um, there's actually one death certificate that tells me that her last name is actually Rudolph, and I think that was for either Jacob Engler's death certificate or, or Cecilia Engler's death certificate, which was a younger sister. But anyway, the last name is actually Rudolph, so it was Thekla Rudolph. I finally got her name. It was its index is Teklar and all sorts of crazy <laughs> cantations. <clears throat> so after I'd worked through all those things using the same methodology, I went over 
Now I'm trying to get some context for some, to give these people not just names and dates, but some personalities and what they did, things like that, besides just farmer and census record and that they were Catholic. Because uh, they're all buried at this Catholic church. I mean, there's about 50 family members that are buried at the church, uh, either by marriage, uh, cousins, uncles, uh, of, uh, of the descendants I'm doing this for. The descendants of these individuals. These individuals are, are ancestors of the people I'm doing this for. Um, so anyway, uh, let's get over to what I found. I thought it was pretty neat. I wanted to share it. Oh yeah, just to, before I get to it, <laughs> not to tease, um, these these gravestones are in pretty good shape. They're all at the graveyard. And they've Someone's done a wonderful job to go over to find a, uh, to post their photos of find a grave with marriage, uh, no, marriage uh, birth dates and death dates, but the gravestones that I have photographs for, um, for example, of Philip Engler and his wife Thecla. Uh, <coughs> see how many generations back is that from the individual. The, the, the senior individual, the, the group of people I'm doing this for, is, and I'll just do a quick count in my head here, we go to her mother, we go to her grandpa, and then we go to her great-grandfather, and her great-grandfather's father, this is the senior individual, the group I'm doing, that herself is a great-grandmother, uh, that Matthew Peter Pote is the father of the great grandfather of the great grandmother, <laughs> whose parents, <laughs> whose wife's parents, are also has a photograph. So it's a great grandmother's great great grandparents right here. I got a lot of exact birth and death dates and photographs of gravestones. I, I, I'm happy with the way it turned out. Now, there's one story that gives a little bit of context, but not much, for how these families lived or what was going on in their lives. They generally were Catholic. There's a very small snippet. There's a, there's a book about history of Catholicism in Kentucky, and there was one very small snippet um, that mentioned uh, the son of this Matthew Pope. Um, Anthony Pope in, in, in a sentence that he was one of the first church members there and living at age 86 but nonetheless um, let's get to this thing so the person I'm talking about now is Martin Engler this was very interesting this is, uh, I found actually found one will I found a will for Filipina Engler's husband William Feast, who also has some of their birth records transcribed from that church. I wish they had the whole lot of them, not just those birth records, but th you know, that's what's available at Roots Web right now. And But I was able to find Martin's, and every fact that he lays out here verifies everything I have on this, all the dates I have, everything. It's very satisfying to read this in that sense, but it was a but the, but the event that it took place was was quite tragic. So I'm gonna, I guess I'll read it. So it's, it's almost you know, it's almost close to unbelievable. So this is from the Paducah Daily News of Saturday, August 18th, 1888, and someone named Kent Kent Johnson transcribed this on July 20th, 2003. So it's killed by lightning. Martin Engler of this county, which is. McCracken County, thus meets his death. At home, besides his blind wife, the sudden summons comes. All the particulars. McCracken County has lost another of her good citizens. Last evening, Mr. Martin Engler of the St. John's neighborhood of Hauser was killed by a stroke of lightning. And this will be sad intelligence to a large acquaintance and many friends who esteemed the deceased, recognizing in him a good citizen, a worthy gentleman, and a valued friend. Most earnest sympathy will be extended to the bereaved wife and children and other relatives. And 
and uh, just just to pause, you know, back in this day, there wasn't any really electricity. I mean, as far as in 1888, I don't think there really was, and certainly not in rural Kansas, uh, Kentucky. And this is a farming family, and basically they needed the able-bodied people to go out there and help work the land so they'd have some to eat. And you know, any time you lose someone uh, that's experienced on the farm in that situation, it's got to be tragic. So this must have been very, very tough to go through. And, and it's ironic because of what had happened. So <clears throat> you know, I'm going to the, partic partic the particulars. This gives you context of maybe a little bit, a snip, a very small glance at their life and then in the end I'll go through the particulars and I'll just brush my camera around and get boastful about how I got all the every single detail they provide whether even where they're vague is verified by, by what I found with the other records and I hadn't been this far along a couple weeks ago so I'm almost exhausting I've almost exhausted every piece of uh, exploration I can I can do um, with this set of records I'm very happy with so far but there's one lead that I'll get into with that other family I just went over and that is that the other family that was doing research that said that uh, Mary Jones was born in Rowan County North Carolina there I seem to recall that there is a decent book out there with some vital records for Rowan County, North Carolina, but I'm not sure, but I digress. Okay, so here are the particulars. It says, the particulars of, sand, of this sad occurrence is gathered by the news from whoever transcribed it couldn't read it, <laughs> who it was. It was as follows. Mr. Engler had been about his farm during the shower, which fell over this section during the evening, and returned to his house at about 7 o'clock slightly damp. He had entered his room and was standing in front of the fireplace while his wife was wiping the rain from his back and shoulders with a towel. He had taken a position with a few feet of the mantle, with his arms slightly elevated, Mrs. Engler at his back, and he just remarked to his wife, uh, Mother, can you reach a little higher? Uh, because she couldn't see. She's blind, so, you know, there's probably a couple wet spots on his shoulders or something. And uh, then there, it's reported there was a bright flash of lightning, strongly visible in the room, and a terrific peal of thunder. Mr. Englert fell at his wife's feet at full length. Miss Englert, who has for years been entirely blind, for the moment failed to realize her sudden great affliction. But a son who was sitting in a room just across the hall and was looking at his parents through the open doors quickly... Uh, divining the true state of affairs, ran to his father's side to find him with but slight, but slight evidence of life. The heart and the pulse could be felt, and there was a quick and faint breathing for a quarter of an hour, but the stricken man never evidenced any consciousness. In less than 20 minutes after the flash of lightning, surrounded by his grief and horror, stricken family, the beloved husband and father, who but a few minutes before was robust in health, and had every assurance of many days I passed away. The stroke which caused Miss Englert's death was barely at all felt by Miss Englert. She remembers there was a slight jar and Mr. Englert fell on the floor. Other members of the family felt the jar, but nothing more. On the second floor of the house, which is a story and a half frame, and in the room just above the one in which Mr. and Miss Englert were standing was an open window, and through this, the bolt to all appearances came, and there is no indication of the house having been struck. From the window, the lightning seemed to have passed to the floor above and down the wall, the plastering of which is slightly cracked, to a large old-fashioned clock standing on the mantel, tearing this to pieces and loosening, loosening slightly and damaging the mantel. From the clock, the lightning apparently leaped to Mr. Engler, and there spent its force. The dial of the clock shows it was stopped at 7.20, and also a watch was hung on the wall two foot away, which was also stopped but not injured. 
An examination of Mr. Englert's body after death exhibited little sign of the manner of his life had been taken. There were no bones broken or no abrasion of the skin. Just beneath his armpit was a glue, blue place, and it looked like it had been made by a small and sharp instrument, but no other mark was visible. The fatal result of the stroke is consequently the more mysterious from this fact than if it had been signs of some severe injury. Mr. Englert was a native of Bavaria, Germany. Okay, so this is this is all the important stuff. So the census records was, would say that he was from Bavaria. And then it says, when 12 years of age, he came to this country with his parents and has lived in the neighborhood steadily where he died since. So age 12, he came over. I had narrowed down their age of entry between 1844 and 1850 because all the children report themselves as having been born in Bavaria through Filipina Engler, who was born in 1845, I should say 1845 and 1850, one, and Kathleen Engler, who was uh, on a gravestone hazard birth date as 9 April 1851, Born, and she always reports herself as having been born in Kentucky in the census. So I, I had their arrival between that those 1845 and 1851. But this tells me, if I subtract 12 from 1835 from Martin, there I get add 12. I get 1847. Let's get let's get back to that. Okay. He followed farming all his life and was very successful. Mr. Engler leaves besides his wife, five sons, three of whom were married. And I didn't really go into the descendants of Martin Engler. I was just trying to build the siblings, which is really what you want to do unless you can't get anything on the sibling. Then you work your way back up to the sibling with the children. Um, Mr. Engler leaves besides his, his wife, five sons, three of whom are married, and five dollars. He also leaves one brother, Mr. Jacob Engler, and three sisters, Mrs. M. Pope, I mean Mrs. Matthew Pope, Mrs. John Roof, which I had, John W. Roof, and Mr. George Worth, who I have a will for, and that's Cecilia. I don't say who they are, though. And, um, and then... And then it says, a sister, Mrs. Feast, that would be following me in a feast, whose birth records have been transcribed and put on Roots Web, died five years since. So that's five years ago, not after this was written. So um, that would be 18... This was written in 1888. He died in 1888. There's 1883. There's your five years. And his mother, as did his mother, so that gives his mother's death date, 1883. There's Thecla, 1883, and that's from her gravestone. Martin Engler, it's got 1873, and it says, as his did his father about 14 years ago. It says, the funeral set for this evening, 5 o'clock. Mass services were held this morning at St. John's Church, where they're all buried, by the way, I'm mentioning of which the deceased has long been a consistent member. This evening there will be further services before the interment. The burial will be in the St. John Cemetery where lie the other deceased members of his family. This is written in 1888, but that's still true to this day. Another thing is, is um, just to get into this, okay, so when the Germans and the Swiss came over, more or less the Swiss would come over and I assume they were German-speaking Swiss, uh, when they came over, they would almost almost form their own little colony, somewhat, uh, wherever they would settle. Uh, it would take a couple generations, really, for, for them to <coughs> uh, kind of... I mean, they weren't exactly Amish, but they were in their own little group. They married p people within you know their group, so, you know, most of the, the marriage records that I see for the, the ancestors of the individuals that I'm doing this for, um, they all married other members of, of the church 
and the other members of the church because they're all buried at the church. It's kind of circular, but it works that way. And I read it just doing some background research with a very limited amount I was able to see on people that came over from Switzerland, however, did this kind of thing, but they were very, very tight. Probably tighter than this as far as being closed outside anything. Um, from this um, community, they kind of have that flavor that and uh, for the individual I was talking to was saying that you know the church was a central kind of place. I mean, all you'd have to do back then, all you could do back then is work the farm and after the farm, well, there's a place you can go to and that's the church. <laughs> Perhaps you can invite people over, but the central place where everybody happened to go and you didn't have to take the effort to get them to come to you was the church. That was the central, pretty much, as far as I could see, in this somewhat isolated area, even now, um, to to for social social gatherings and everything. And that's pretty much almost in line with what the what I've read about the Swiss and very very vaguely imply, but nothing really. And it's it's too general to say, oh, you're Swiss, so you did this or that, or you would do this or that. So. It, doesn't really mean much. All I could say is what I've seen is it's it was pretty much a, a tight community until more more recent when say within the last hundred years. It's people started to go away from the area that was the place they had gone to and stayed for many, many years. So for example, um Philip Engler, you know, having arrived in 1847, 1888 isn't that isn't that long, but there was there were people that were still from that family, and there probably is still to this day a great number of people from all the families that were German immigrants that came over and settled around in the in McCracken County that are of German descent, the Roofs, the Worths, the Potes, the Englerts, the I know I've got a, a griefs. <laughs> yeah, I may have forgot, may have forgotten some last names, but those were all pretty much descendants of people that had come over. I think I would just I would guess it had something to do with. Uh, I don't have any verifying evidence. I don't. I don't have any documents to say. You know, these people are leaving as you know. To, to get out of the the war conditions at the time, you know, I don't see that. But I'm, right now, I have the implication, just based on ancillary evidence, that they all had come over at around the mid 1840s, and that just happens to be around the time those wars had taken place. Very, very large family, and they had a lot of children. They a lot of them lived long lives, very, very long lives for the time they were in. So. I mean, there's one ancestor that lived to be 102 and was born 1870 or something like that. <laughs> um, a lot of them lived in their 70s or 80s. Very healthy people and made made good from uh, coming to this country and prospered. And by golly, I think that's what everyone that had come before would want people that followed to be able to do. And you know, life life's a little bit different now. Either it's <laughs> life isn't good enough for you unless you're living in the big city and you have all the inter items of entertainment, which I guilt myself. <laughs> I guess I don't know if you really call it guilty, but um, life's different. Yeah, I guess is the point. Okay, that's it. Um, so anyway, I hope in two ways. One, if you just happen to have some relation to to these people and come across this video and it happens to help you, great. Um, the other is maybe just about how the various different angles and various, various ways of getting information to get out what you want and just a general methodology as to an approach. First, get a basic framework 
at the story, the overall story of what happened within the group of parents to children, how many children were born, and you can get that from the census, you can get that from a local biography. Um, they, they, there are some of these communities that had, like Kenosha County had local biographies. They would just go to a farm and they'd say, hey, this is your farm. Where'd you come from? Give me the names of your kids and who they married. You know, so, or you work your way back from the census as best you can in the years where they list everybody in the household and you try to account for everybody in those households. So you get an overall context. You can find little gems like the obituary and it'll make sense to you. You, know, you won't have to scratch your head. Well, I'm not sure if this is the right one. If you have that context, you, you'll be able to do it. Also, in some cases, when you have the context of where some of the brothers or sisters went, you might find out where that mystery marriage record lies. You know, um, get everything as a whole, and then once you have something that makes sense and is reinforcing, and all the ancillary evidence and everything fits and works together, then you have a pretty satisfactory piece of work that can go can go back rather far and don't skip anything any kind of evidence gravestones are very important when you get back back uh, earlier than 1850 and the birth marriage and death records didn't exist anywhere but in the church or in a family bible you may be very happy to find that that birth or marriage or death record on a gravestone especially you know some of the birth records that I have for some there for immigrant ancestors the Englerts there, uh, their birth date isn't, if it still is, exists after World War II, is probably in some church in Germany, written in German, I, you'd be hard pressed to even be able to get to it. Um, so that's about it, get your story, get then get as many vital records as you can, try to account for different things, approach different things, try to answer questions for the grave stones that are in a private place. See if you can fill in more gaps. It might give you more answers. On the other hand, um, get, get all the vital records. Yeah, I think I'm done. <laughs> okay.